Now, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a former offensive lineman, so I always like to look at the technique, or excuse me, the protection and the technique of the protection. Um, up front, the Rams are in a half slide protection, in a half slide protection. One, one side will be in a man protection, and the other side will be in a zone. Uh, the main side here is the left side. Uh, the back almost always will protect to the man side unless he's given some sort of tag. Uh, we talked about earlier uh, earlier articles about a hotel check. He's not going to be able to do a hotel check here because he's going to be responsible for a blitzing backer. Um, the zone here will start with the center. And zone protection, I won't go into it too great a detail, but zone protection or sometimes known as gap uh, protection uh, just means that the, the, the offensive line does not necessarily have a man per se, but, but rather a gap or a zone they are covering. Typically, it will start with the outside blocker having the last man, last man on the end of the line of scrimmage, and then you work your way inside. And uh, like I said, I don't want to get too much into detail on that because it's not that exciting. Uh, there are different sets the linemen will take. Uh, when I say sets, I'm referring to how an offensive lineman pass protects. Essentially, you know how he, uh, the offensive lineman sets up in pass protection. The sets uh, for particular play are determined by the design of the play. So obviously, a play that lasts longer, say a, a five-step drop, is going to require a kick set. Uh, this particular play is a play-action fake. So instead of a kick set, the offensive line will use a technique called a firm set. The idea is that you attack selling run, you get into the defender, just like you would do selling run, and then you will set up eventually to protect uh, for the pass. The key here in, in, in any play action is the pad level of the offensive line. Low pad level off, uh, off the snap tells the defender run uh, the second, at the second level and the third level. Um, that's that's basically how you start the play action by pad level up front and then uh, your quarterback and your back carrying out the fake. Um, if you go back and watch this play, look at Harvey Dahl's pad level. It's, it's very low. He does a good job selling run. Uh, he also does uh, a good job not committing that outside hand to help uh, Turner on Sopega there. Or, uh, uh, he keeps that outside arm free so he can take on Bowman as Bowman become blitzes through that strong side B gap. Um, this is actually an extremely tough block for Steven Jackson because he has to carry out a fake with the mesh point uh, on the right side of the line and then has to get back to the left side uh, to, to take on Patrick Willis. Um, and when you add in the fact that it is Patrick Willis coming down the gun, uh, and you and you uh, you know think about what he's doing on this play, it just turns into an absolute great block uh, by Stephen Jackson, and it's basically a play-saving block. Uh, he he does a great job of of, of stonewalling Willis, who is one of the best, if not the best, uh, interior linebacker in the uh, in the league. So now we'll look at, finally, we'll, we'll get to uh, what happens after the ball is snapped. Uh, Austin Pettis does a great job at winning, uh, winning at the line of scrimmage. Uh, he knows he's got man coverage with the safety, and he, and he probably knows that he's got Whitner on, uh, you know, he's going to draw Whitner to him, and he knows that Danny Amendola just embarrassed Dante Whitner on a whip route uh, the play before to get him down to the two-yard line. So off the line, you'll notice uh, Pettis does uh, close the gap very quickly using a technique called foot fire. It's fast, choppy steps just to close down that, that bubble uh, that's between him and, and his defender. And what he's going to do now is he'll jab step outside. He's going to try to get Whitner to, to respect that by flipping his hips and bite on the outside release. Whitner kind of does a good job of staying square. Uh, but where, where he really does win, that is, Pettis really does win, is is the club swim he's going to use on Whitner. Uh, this is a technique using an inside hand to club the defender's arm. 
and then swim over the top of that shoulder that he's clubbing. It's got to be tight. You can't expose yourself to getting punched into the ribs there. It's a technique a defensive lineman used to to rush the, the quarterback, but it's also you know, a great technique for uh, receivers trying to beat press at the line of scrimmage. Uh, he does a great – Pettis does a great job of – of finishing the swim by getting his hips through the zone and and he's he's now beaten the press uh of Whitner. The slant now is is wide open as we see the slant now with Deshaun Golden uh it sucked up reading run and, and also on in man coverage probably on Lance Kendricks like we talked before. Bradford has the whole middle of the middle of the end zone to deliver this ball. And one thing we'll note is, is Bradford's technique there. He's <clears throat> He knows that Willis is coming. So what he does is fades, he throws, jump throws away. So one, he gets, he, he prevents Willis from blocking this, this throw. And he also gets height when he throws it. He gets tall when he throws it by jumping. And that also prevents uh, Willis, you know, from blocking blocking this ball down right as it's thrown because Willis is in his face as he throws this football and uh, he, Bradford does a good job of fading away and getting getting tall to get this ball over Willis and over Nav- uh, Navarro Bowman as well who, who kind of peels off at the last second uh, so it's a great throw by Bradford now we talked earlier about how it's not at the same angle <laughs> um, that's simply because, it, say, for instance, Whitner runs with Pettis there, as we see a 31 now at the top of the slant. Gibson is now running his slant to um, replace where Whitner was. So it's not the same. Pettis and Gibson aren't running the same angle on the slant. Uh, it is the same route, though. And uh, as you see, if, Gibson, if, if Whitner were to run, if Gibson is able to beat Carlos Rogers. The ball is right there, right where Whitner would have been originally. So I, I really like the play call from Schottenheimer, and this uh, slide illustrates it. Um, it's a, it, it, it is basically, you know, pick your poison. It's a great play call. Um, and we'll close here. I know this video is kind of uh, becoming uh, pretty long here, so... We'll just close here. Uh, I know that you're probably thinking it's a two-yard touchdown, big deal. No, you know what? What? What of it? Uh, but this play had some significance to me. I, first, you consider the situation. They need a touchdown. They are on the road playing a team that was just an overtime field goal away from the Super Bowl last year, and to march down the field and score with a big step was a big step forward for this offense. And uh, by the way, this offense, wow. With Danny Amendola and as much, it's just a totally different offense. Uh, but even if you dig a little bit deeper, you'll see that the Niners are are ranked first in uh, defensive red zone attempts. They only allow two red zone attempts uh, per game. And they're fourth in the league in uh, red zone touchdowns allowed per game. So the fact that we got down there twice uh, and scored twice is, is, is basically s- statistically unlikely. Um, and, and also, I like that Austin Pettis scored the touchdown. This guy has kind of been up and down uh, for the most part since coming here. You think back to him not calling for a fair catch a couple times last year. It just kind of drove you insane. Uh, but in, in Billy, Def- Billy Devaney's defense, this is what he was drafted for. You know, When Pettis was at Boise State, he was their red zone target. He, eight of his 10 touchdowns came in the red zone. He's got great size. He's 6'3", 210, 215. Makes him a great target down there. This guy has great change of uh, direction ability. And if you remember, he destroyed the three-cone drill at the Combine in 2011. I think he's number three or two or three in the three-cone drill. Uh, for his size, that's, that's, that's very good. So... Uh, hopefully someone emerges as a red zone target for the Rams because they have been uh, not very good down there. Uh, if it's Pettis and and or Quick, uh, you know, the, the offense will change quickly when they start converting uh, red, these red zone attempts for touchdowns and not field goals. Uh, now, I, I know some of you guys were uh, upset about the timeout 
I don't necessarily blame them for calling a timeout and, and talking about uh, the play that they ran to score this touchdown. Um, I, I don't mind it at all, to be quite honest. Uh, the defense has got to go out and make plays, uh, especially against a backup quarterback. And some some of you guys were upset about the fact that they played a bit soft on that final drive. Uh, you know, if, if you think back to Greg Williams as a defensive coordinator for the Saints last year getting beat in San Francisco in the playoffs, you think about they were blitzing uh, nonstop on that final drive. They were they got burned by the blitz on that final drive. Um, so I don't I don't necessarily blame them. I know it's not the same defense. We're not the Saints defense and Alex Smith was m- missing, but uh, I'm sure that drive uh, where the Saints got burned had something to do with their Fisher's choice of attack uh, or lack thereof on that final drive. So we'll end here. Uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's it. I know the graphics are up there with uh, Techno Bowl. But uh, like I said, we'll get better as we go. I, I can promise you that. So thanks for watching. See you next week.